Hey everyone, it's Mr. Drake. This video is going to very briefly, in very broad strokes, cover the later stages of the American Revolutionary War, uh, primarily covering the period after the Battle of Saratoga. We're not going to get really deep into any battles or anything. The primary purpose here is just to explore the factors that led to the American victory, uh, focusing primarily on uh, the blunders that the British made in the later stages of the war. So with that, let's get started. It's pretty well known by anyone who studies American history or even has a passing knowledge of it that Saratoga is the big turning point of the Revolutionary War because it leads to France becoming involved on the American side. But France and Spain were allies, so Spain ends up joining up in the American Revolutionary War as well on the side of France and the Continental Army. Now, instead of providing military assistance, uh, Spain's aid was more of a material nature. They provided financing for the war effort. Now, at this point, the war in the North kind of came to a stalemate. Neither side had much of an advantage. Both sides had a lot of difficulties um, with replenishing their resources and keeping their armies fully staffed and everything. Morale really was not great. The weather was crummy. It's the north, it's cold, right? Um, so eventually, Britain uh, and their primary general at the time, Henry Clinton, whose picture you see there, decide to change the game up by focusing more on the south. And so the later stages of the war are marked by a shift in strategy and in the primary theaters of fighting to the southern part of the colonies. The decision to focus primarily on the South was a fairly calculated move. Um, the South had a much larger concentration of loyalists among the colonists. So, Britain thought that if they were to invade the South, establish themselves, take over some of the major cities like Savannah and Charleston, that eventually the loyalists would rise up and would join their ranks and eventually make it much easier to subdue the Continental Army. Further, there's a lot of fighting going on in the Caribbean now, especially once France got involved, so the British wanted their navy closer to the Caribbean, so if they were anchored in the south, it would be easier to go reinforce whatever uh, vessels were fighting in the Caribbean if they needed to, rather than were they, say, in Philadelphia or New York or something like that. And initially, this plan works. The British are able to take Savannah and Charleston, the two biggest southern port cities in 1779 and 1780, and don't really have much trouble doing so. The big blunder that the British make here is just a, an overestimation of how much Loyalist support there was going to be. There had been a lot of Native American attacks, especially on the frontier, so a lot of these people had ended up joining up with colonial militias to defend their homes, and the Loyalists just never came to the British military in the large numbers that the army really needed them to, and so that ends up causing them a lot of problems down the road. After the South was captured, Clinton handed command of the army in the southern part of the uh, uh, North American continent over to George Cornwallis, who is known, uh, if you're a studier of American history, uh, from the American standpoint, is, is I guess known as the antagonist, uh, the primary antagonist of the American Revolutionary War. And the Continental Army is commanded by Horatio Gates, who had been the winner uh, at the Battle of Saratoga. But things don't go well for Gates in the South, most notably at the Battle of Camden in August of 1780 in South Carolina, where despite outnumbering the British forces nearly two to one, I think it was 4,000 to about 2,200, uh, the British win, and the French Major General, who was with the Continental Army, Johann de Kalb, ends up killed during the battle. So this is pretty much the low point for the Continental Army in the South. And Gates is relieved from command uh, in humiliation, and he's replaced by Nathaniel Green, who was one of Washington's more trusted uh, subordinates at that time. And it was at this time that Cornwallis thought that Georgia and South Carolina were more or less locked down. He would move into North Carolina, drum up loyalist support there, and then move toward ending the war for good. He ends up running into a lot more resistance in North Carolina, uh, in many cases from people who had come from the mountains um, in militias 
to fight the British. They were called the Overmountain Men, and they are the ones who primarily won the Battle of Kings Mountain and the Battle of Charlotte, not uh, the official Continental Army as much. Cornwallis was said to be so irritated by the resistance he faced in Charlotte that he wrote to someone that it was like going through a hornet's nest of rebellion, if you ever wondered how the NBA team in Charlotte got their name. And from there, Green and Cornwallis fight a long, protracted series of battles that lasts over a year through North Carolina and into Virginia. And the British won nearly every single one of those battles. But the Continental Army was able to sort of win by not losing. They never got forced into a decisive battle. They were just able to chip away at the British's um, resources and, and manpower. And those loyalists that Cornwallis and the rest of the British Army were banking on just never showed up in the large numbers that they needed. And so by the time Cornwallis is uh, pinned in at Yorktown, he doesn't have a lot of reinforcements, and he ends up trapped there. Um, and on October 19, 1781, uh, Cornwallis surrenders to the Continental Army and uh, famously was so humiliated by having to do so that he, re he couldn't even face the, his American counterparts. He sent an aide to deliver his sword uh, because he just couldn't be bothered to show his face. After Yorktown, the American delegation goes to France to negotiate the treaty that's going to end the war. Um, it's led by Ben Franklin, who's there in the center in the dark coat. Uh, John Adams is sitting to his right. I believe that's John Jay standing up. John Jay would become the, on the far left, would become the first Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court in 1789. If you're wondering what happened to the right-hand side of this painting, the British, still humiliated over taking an L during the war, uh, refused to sit to be painted uh, at this treaty negoti negotiation, so it just got left blank. So in the Treaty of Paris that was uh, ratified in 1783, Great Britain does recognize American independence and cedes all land that they uh, previously held east of the Mississippi River uh, over to the new country. Britain also makes separate side deals with France and Spain, um, a lot of horse trading of colonies in the Caribbean and stuff that is never in a million years going to come up in an AP U.S. history exam, or, and I really wouldn't worry about it too much. The Treaty of Paris does omit a couple of things that are going to end up causing some problems in the United States uh, as they start out as a new nation. One, um, the British do nothing to protect the Native Americans. Um, the Iroquois especially thought for sure that the British would somehow work into the treaty a um, clause that would protect them or give them some kind of land or sovereignty or something, and instead the Native Americans get completely hung out to dry by the British, uh, leaving them susceptible to exploitation by American settlers and even in many cases, of course, over the subsequent centuries, the American government. Also, the boundary with Florida on the south is left unresolved, um, so there are going to be some disputes with Spain over where that border is. Of course, eventually, Spain cedes Florida to the United States. Uh, that doesn't happen, though, until 1819, so there are some conflicts uh, before that. That's going to do it for this video. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments. Cheers.